What do you get when you combine Gatling guns, humanoid rats, and an infinite supply of uranium bullets? The capacity to inflict millions of casualties, most of which are friendly fire. Today, I'm going to be playing the Skaven incorrectly. Normally, you'd recruit thousands of volunteers to test your munitions on, or Frankenstein innocent creatures into abominations of nature. But instead of that, I'll be honoring the Second Amendment by rounding up every mentally unstable rat I can find and arming them with weapons of mass destruction. In this game, there are ingenious wizards who live for thousands of years, engineers working with perfected blueprints that have proven their worth for generations, and schizophrenic rats snorting deadly doses of amphetamines. Given this, I think it's pretty obvious who makes the best firearms. We begin our journey in this large pile of garbage, and our primary objective is to make this the most beautiful city in the world. There are many ways we could accomplish this, but the most straightforward, reasonable option is to immediately abandon it. This will make sense in a bit. Instead of having a nice army to begin with, we only get one weirdly hairy version of Iron Man and several heavily armed psych ward escapees. But worry not, it will only be a very long time until we can get any more units. I'm sure we'll be fine. One very minor, definitely not overpowered thing that we have going for us is infinite ammo. We can unlock this immediately in the Forbidden Workshop for three barrels of uranium and a large pile of mystery meat. I would be surprised if we actually benefit from this in the short term though, because to make use of it we need to survive for an extended period of time without accidentally shooting each other. There seems to be a pro-gun control rally near our beautiful headquarters, so it's time to introduce them to freedom and a few thousand lethal doses of radiation. The main issue with our strategy here is that we're incredibly weak in melee. We also have nearly zero options to avoid melee. That's why this challenge will be listed as a primary cause of my inevitable mental breakdown. For the moment, however, it appears that Iron Rat can hold back quite a few enemy units, and hundreds of bullets are quite effective against wooden shields, so we managed to win this battle. We then turned the city they built from the ground up with their bare hands into a breeding den for these lovely rats. Now, it's time to execute our first diabolical scheme. We recolonized the ruins of Skaven Blight by throwing a couple weak old pizza slices into it, and within seconds, a New York subway station appeared. For the Skaven, this is also known as a Tier 3 settlement. The reason I sacrificed the entirety of my faction's food supply for this is that now we can start constructing this building immediately, and start recruiting rattling guns in 8 turns rather than 20. So as we're sitting here, starving to death, Let's take a look at our diplomatic options. To our south, there are weird fish zombie pirates. To our west, there's some very agitated cows. To our north, there's Vietnam, but worse. And to our east, there's an army of alcoholics who all happen to be exactly 5 foot 11. I expect that we're gonna have a hard time finding any allies here. Six months later, after a staggering amount of cannibalism, we're finally able to recruit rattling gunners. Unfortunately, it's a bit late now because the murder cows and the zombie pirates have decided to eat rats for dinner. I sat outside Skaven Blight hoping to encourage them to attack right away rather than besieging us, and fortunately they did. Because I, like these mentally stable rats, live in a constant state of overwhelming paranoia, I built up a garrison in Skaven Blight as soon as I reoccupied it. This battle was hard carried by that garrison, and therefore, boring. After repelling their attacks and completing our recruitment though, we finally have more than a handful of rattling guns. Very conveniently, this is when Morher and the cows decided to enter our line of fire. And by our line of fire, I'm referring to everyone and everything within 5 miles of us. Regarding our army composition, you may think that rattling guns are great, and therefore getting more of them is a good idea. And you would be absolutely correct. To a point. As you can see in this rigorously constructed scientific diagram, more rattling guns equals more gooder, but only as long as there's still enough friendly units to accidentally turn into furry red jello. At this point, which I've dubbed the accidental war crime ceiling, we've run out of room in our armies for Skaven slaves and need to resort to shooting the enemy instead. This is highly ineffective, as they tend to charge our valiant gunners who run away the second they're faced with actual combat. What's my brilliant plan to deal with this? I don't know because if I don't even know my own brilliant plan, then there's no way that they'll see it coming. The largest issue for us here is that Morher is immune to bullets. Seriously. He has 75% missile resistance and a massive health pool. He's damn near unkillable in this matchup. Fortunately, their fast units are very killable, especially when they just sit there and get shot repeatedly. 
Good job, guys. The rest of their army proved to be a bit less dumb, however, and they actually attempted to stop the infinite rain of radioactive bullets in a timely fashion. Our only real option to deal with this is to enter a checkerboard formation, which is designed to allow the rats in the back to keep shooting as the cows brutally murder the rats in the front. This would have been far more effective if the rats weren't absolute cowards. On top of that, Morher had a few gigantic mutated chaos spawn up his sleeve. Literally. That fucker can summon two units of unbreakable meat tanks out of either thin air or the corpses of our beautiful rats. Even as the smaller cows exceeded their acceptable lifetime doses of radiation, Morher and these meaty bastards tanked a few hundred thousand more bullets. In the end, we won not because we were actually able to kill Morher, but because we ruthlessly bullied him by using this minus 30% speed debuff and our infinite ammo to encircle him and just run away anytime he started chasing one of our units. Physically, this didn't really deal damage to him, but emotionally, it definitely did, and after a while, he just sort of gave up on life and crumpled into a ball on the ground. A few rats may have died, but that just means that we have some extra rations for the next round of recruits. We still have threats on both sides, however, so our best option is to kill one of them. As the cows have only one real settlement surrounded by an absurd quantity of manure, they were the obvious choice. We went over there through the underway, and somehow Morher just instantly reappeared after being melted by radiation. This battle was hard. I managed to set up a few good lines of fire through choke points, but even still, they did a lot of damage to us. At one point though, four of their units blobbed up together. Even after dropping a nuke on them though, they kept fighting for way longer than I expected, and Morher summoning Chaos Spawn into my gunners did a hell of a lot of damage. That took so painfully long. Oh, we lost so many rattling guns. To colonize these settlements buried under 60 feet of manure, all we need to do is tell the Skaven slaves that there's warpstone buried under it. Within 15 minutes, they'll construct an entire colony under that shit and die of exhaustion before they get the chance to question us. Several turns and settlements later, the rancid fish people decided to dig for buried treasure in my territory. Little did they know, the top 20 feet of soil is composed entirely of the brittle skeletons of Skaven slaves that we ate during the great food shortage of turns 1 through 10. As I moved up, I realized that they had two other armies, including their legendary lord, able to reinforce the large garrison of their walled settlement. In order to attack something like that, I would need to be completely fucking insane. Hello class, today's lecture is on kill boxes. If you've played RimWorld, you're probably familiar with the concept. Essentially, a kill box is an area that enemy combatants enter alive and leave dead. This can be accomplished in many ways, but today we'll be focusing on concentration of firepower. If, perhaps, your enemy was dumb enough to leave part of their settlement undefended, and you infiltrated it with several hundred machine gunners, you might be able to use a choke point as a kill box by simply pointing a lot of guns at it and shooting anything that moves. This can be highly effective, as the enemy has no way to flank you, shoot you, or force your guns into melee without first being blasted until they turn into either a plasma or a gas, depending on what type of meat they used to be made out of. The only risks of this particular kill box are 1. Friendly fire, and 2. Rendering your opponents inedible. There are many other types of kill boxes that you should learn about in this class, but I don't care about them, and I'm tenured, so you'll spend the next 15 weeks hearing stories about my extremely boring personal life, alongside the occasional anecdote about a weird student that I had 8 years ago. This battle took 40 real minutes, and I eventually had to leave my lovely kill box once they realized that walking into it one at a time might not be a good idea. Fortunately, this was still a pretty effective strategy, and I know that because a good 80% of our casualties were from friendly fire. So, I was joking when I wrote that. And then, I actually did the math. It turns out that 83.6% of our casualties were literally from friendly fire. They killed 21 of us, and 128 of us died. Now, the salty bastards are left with just one army that I could deal with quite easily if I actually decided to deal with it right away. Instead, I went for another one of their settlements, and they attacked a few of mine behind me. Ikit Claw has one very good thing going for him here, though. His movement range is absolutely insane, with both our technology and the buffs from the hero in his army, so we just zoomed halfway across the map to blast him in the face. By turn 24, we wiped out all of Sartosa and took all their shit. Some of the French decided to attack us from the south, but thankfully, our disease-ridden rats with machine guns are a bit stronger than their disease-ridden peasants with bows. That trebuchet did hurt a hell of a lot, though. 
At this point, Ikit Claw added six feet, six whiskers, six war crimes to his Tinder profile, which immediately incurred the wrath of the Short King Liberation Army. Luckily, as they were all extremely drunk, they had both of their armies sit outside their settlements. We had our second army that we just finished recruiting take this one as they just watched us, then Ikit Claw got the chance to conduct an experiment on these lads. What happens if we literally just stand still and shoot them as they run up a big hill? They died, apparently. Minus 30% speed on a unit that's already painfully slow basically just stops them. They didn't even make it halfway to our guns before they were all entirely dead. Also, I guess ghosts aren't entirely immune to bullets, at least radioactive ones. After an extremely close underway interception battle that I won solely due to dropping a nuke onto like 10 dudes, the dwarfs were entirely out of armies. In the mountains, at least. While we were dealing with their home territory, Belagar Ironhammer was crusading against these dwarf-eating ogres that are, somehow, the most reasonable creatures around us. The ogres were open to a defensive alliance, so now we can actually see what's going on around us. This would be great if there was anything good going on around us. On the upside, though, considering that we have two full armies that each fire a minimum of 3 million pure uranium rounds per battle, our economy is doing surprisingly well. Now, after my killbox shenanigans earlier, you may be feeling confident in my ability to deal with siege battles. So was I, until this one. On this map, I couldn't get any angles to actually shoot the short little bastards. They weaponized their height by simply standing behind anything bulletproof while shooting the shit out of us with their crossbows. The one real advantage to their disgusting, gunpowderless projectiles is that if you shoot them up, they come down. Our bullets, on the other hand, simply cease to exist after a few hundred meters. That's because if they didn't, shooting one unit of rattling guns wildly into the air would wipe out all life on the planet. The only reason my sanity is still intact enough to continue speaking coherently after this battle is that our lord just zoomed into the middle of their city on his electric unicycle and declared that it was his now. For some reason, the dwarves just agreed and left. This settlement also makes the rattling guns both cheaper and stronger, which is very, very nice. Belagar does seem to want it back though, so I'm gonna see if I can ambush him. In the meantime, however, we're gonna follow in the footsteps of every global superpower in the history of the world, and start in invading a random country for no justifiable reason. Naturally, I chose the worst possible matchup for us, and they'll have an immense home turf advantage. Luckily, instead of fighting this battle and taking immense losses, we can just auto-resolve this and get a better result than should have ever been possible. This is because the game knows that rattling guns are extremely strong. What the game doesn't factor into the auto-resolves, however, is how incredibly stupid our strategy is. It just sees our infinite ammo and potential damage output and goes, yup, good enough, without considering considering that we are the worst possible type of glass cannon. Not only do we have glass bones and paper skin, these fucking rats can't go five seconds without shooting each other for no goddamn reason. Somehow, we stole over 10,000 gold from this tree, though, so at least we have that going for us. A small army of small men walked right into our ambush. I had the brilliant idea of setting up two lines of guns, one on either side of the enemy. This worked tremendously well at killing the dwarves at the cost of a, frankly, impressive amount of friendly fire. In a surprising turn of events, it turns out that some of the Skaven slaves don't appreciate being eaten alive the second we run low on food. So, out of the goodness of our soft, bleeding hearts, we'll be killing them before we eat them in the future. Unless we're really hungry. To establish our dominance, Ikit Claw caused irreparable damage to the most significant cultural landmark in the history of Wood Elf civilization. I'm sure they'll be more likely to agree to our demands after that. One big advantage to using only rattling guns is that instead of upgrading all the other awesome units in the Forbidden Workshop, we're able to spend our warp fuel building lots and lots of nukes. The only possible downside to dropping nukes on all of our enemies, even when they're literally inside of our cities, is that the nukes tend to be single-use weapons. We can partially remedy this, though, by gently encouraging Skaven slaves to recover nuclear debris immediately after detonation. Belagar Ironhammer appears to be mildly upset that we murdered 90% of his clan and turned his home into our trap house. He left a weaker army in front of his main one, which is a perfect opportunity for us to wall camp him. Oh. This is the one time I actually don't want to ambush someone, but fortunately I also ambushed Belagar, so it sort of worked out. Having learned from my mistake of setting up two lines of fire that just shoot each other in the previous ambush, I did the same thing again. 
To be fair, I angled them slightly this time, which did help a bit, but we still shot the shit out of each other. This battle came down to the fact that I have infinite ammo and they're slower than tortoises on ketamine. They're also as tough as tortoises on ketamine though, so they got shot in the face a hundred times and asked for 100 more please. Thankfully, by simply walking away from them, turning around, and shooting them again, we were more than able to oblige. They're unbreakable ghost heroes with basically 90% resistance though? I'd rather not talk about them, let's just move on here. In their infinite wisdom, the Wood Elves decided to sit in their cozy settlements and watch me murder their neighbors one by one. To be fair, they should have been safe there, but the game had other ideas. By turning on Lightning Strike, which gives us absolutely zero advantages in this situation and just makes our army tired for no reason, we were able to auto-resolve these two full armies with zero losses. We may not always outlive our enemies, but we can always outfuck them. By declaring a faction-wide rat orgy, I was able to start assembling a third army of rattling guns. Having already desecrated the Wood Elf Sacred Monument, we now stole it outright. In historically accurate fashion, we'll be using it to generate as much capital as possible to speed up the downfall of its creators. It's a very good thing that I started building up that third army, because Orion definitely would have attacked us otherwise. Thankfully, he decided that not allowing Ikit Claw to burn his home to the ground might be a good idea. The Bertonian menace appears to have spread to our north as well, so I decided to deal with them peacefully. The only peace they'll ever know is the peace of death, so I provided that to them promptly. Through a string of impressively terrible strategic decisions, I landed my second army in a situation where they are absolutely going to get attacked by Orion and most likely going to die. This is the exact moment I realized that the auto-resolves aren't just favorable for the rattling guns, they are definitely broken. Despite being in force march and therefore exhausted, we win this auto-resolve with zero units lost and only medium casualties. This auto-resolve is so broken that I felt guilty and just decided to fight it manually. The hardest things to deal with here are that they have more range than us, deal a lot of damage, and have borderline unbreakable meat shields. Luckily, in a big brain AI move, they just sent up their best units to die alone and unsupported. We then dropped a nuke onto three decent units and dealt with the rest of them by hard targeting their archers and ignoring their infantry. Orion is a big, weird creature with comically large throwing spears. Fortunately, although his morale is unbreakable, his body certainly isn't. So we just shot him a lot of times with all of the guns until he stopped throwing his spears at us. Unsurprisingly, the rest of their forces routed quite quickly after we vaporized him. This is how much damage we dealt to his main army without intentionally chasing them down. Those vegans were quite determined. Taking clear inspiration from my brilliant tactics, the Fey Enchantress decided to try her hand at leading her army to certain death. Okay, are you in my range? Yes, you are flying low. Okay, I should have I should have seen that. But everything's happening extremely quickly here. And actually, yep, she's dead. That's that's the last spell cast. That's the first and the last. And oh my god, they've already routed. We didn't even have 31 seconds. 31 seconds. That is quite literally in my entire time of playing this game. The most brutal massacre I have ever seen. Next time someone tells you that 30 seconds isn't long enough, show them that battle. Finally though, for the first time in quite a while, we've met a worthy foe. The Bretonians may be worthless pieces of shit, but they do excel at one thing. Simping for the Fey Enchantress. Every single Bretonian on the continent is now attempting to murder our beautiful rattling guns, which may not sound intimidating until you realize that they have both good shields and the ability to move faster than dwarves. This is a horrifying combination, but we have two very good ways to deal with it. The first is to force their larger armies to come onto the battlefield late by attacking their smaller army directly, and the second is this. The fact that they weren't deterred by either the nuke killing like a thousand of them or having to climb over a pile of their comrades' radioactive corpses was more than a little terrifying. Their cavalry did an unsurprisingly good job of stopping us from firing, and then the tide of unwashed masses eventually overwhelmed our guns. Fortunately, the Bretonian peasants, no matter how angry, are still cowardly pieces of shit. So they promptly routed after Ikit Claw shot their lord with a radioactive fire hose. As we ravenously expanded even further, we encountered a minor issue in that these particular Bretonian shitters have a lot of military allies. We got a bit of gold from Grom's paunch, and then, because we simply joined the war rather than declaring one, we didn't incur the wrath of their allies. Now, does this make sense? No, not at all. Is it even an intended game mechanic? 
Fuck if I know. But will I abuse it? Absolutely. Our carefully conducted, ethically sound experiments have upgraded the Forbidden Workshop to Tier 3, unlocking its final buff for the Rattling Guns, which at this point is making it pretty difficult to lose. The Cold Blood versus Warm Blood War has been raging in Lustria for the last 5,000 years, but Ikiklaw has come up with an ingenious solution. All we need to do is warm them up to solve our irreconcilable differences and achieve world peace. We'll be attempting that here by gently injecting them with small doses of radiation until their core body temperature reaches 100 degrees Celsius. To speed up the process, we began by applying a harmless thermonuclear reaction to several of the subjects. Overall, the first stage of the trial was an overwhelming success. Then, our second round of testing proved the efficacy of this treatment on even the largest and most heavily armored cold-blooded creatures. We ought to resolve this final settlement, because fuck siege battles. And with that, our wonderful journey of scientific discovery has reached its conclusion. Big thanks to my patrons and YouTube members, as always. I guess that's it. I keep thinking I'll come up with a cool outro, but I can't really think of any good ideas, so let me know if any of you degenerates have some. Peace out.